Hi again and good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. We are presenting this morning on health insurance changes in response to COVID-19. There have been a number of federal and state uh, rules and regulations changes that have been implemented very quickly in response to the pandemic. And we presented a version of this, I think about two weeks ago, and there have already been several new uh, state and federal policy changes that have come down since then. So we're gonna bring you up to speed on all of those. Uh, your host today is going to be Seamus Durak. He's here and we're going to go ahead and get moving. Great. So our agenda for today, really quickly, I'll introduce Seamus. Um, he's going to take you through uh, the series of policy changes. First, going to break down a quick overview of health insurance markets. There are several different types of health insurance. They're regulated in different ways. And so Seamus is going to break that down for us really quickly. Then he'll do a dive into the actual changes to the health insurance rules. Some of them have come down very, very recently. Um, and so we're still even digesting them. And at the end, we'll have a quick recap of everything we learned. Uh, and there will be an opportunity throughout for questions. So if you have any questions, there should be a little button at the bottom of your screen here on Zoom that says Q&A, you can press that icon and type in your question. That'll come to me and Seamus and we'll do our very best to answer it. Um, you can also, there's a, a chat panel over to the right that allows you to chat with Seamus and I. Uh, and you can feel free to submit your questions or comments there as well. Uh, but your host today is gonna be Seamus Jurak. He's a staff attorney at Ripen. He's also a health policy analyst and he primarily supports our call center at Ripen. We have a health insurance uh, consumer call center, free consumer assistance for anyone who calls in. And Seamus is a part of that team. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to him. Great, well, thanks very much, Mark. And thank you all for coming out today to, to talk a little bit about some of these health insurance changes. I know the, uh, the um, evolution of this has been kind of quick and frequently uh, can be a little bit confusing. So we're hoping to peel that back a little bit and how some of those changes have affected consumers and will continue to do so. Um, before we get started, I wanna talk a little bit about the Ripen Call Center uh, for anyone who might not be familiar with some of our, uh, our work. Um, we, uh, the Rhode Island Parent Information Network runs a, uh, a call center for any health insurance issues for any Rhode Islander or anyone who has Rhode Island insurance. Um, it's a live answer phone helpline. Uh, it's available now during the, the crisis, but anytime as well. Uh, we're staffed from eight to five, uh, five days a week. Um, you can call us that number there, the 401-270-0101 uh, with any sort of health insurance issue. We help uh, across all insurance markets uh, for any Rhode Islander, regardless of where they get their insurance. Um, and we do more than just kind of answer phone calls uh, and give advice on a, on a single one-off basis. We, we do advocacy from start to finish. We, uh, we take a case in um, and then we'll work with that individual and you'll have one point of contact for the entirety of your, uh, uh, your case generally, uh, which allows you to kind of uh, not have to retell the story every time you call a call center uh, and build a connection uh, with people who have expertise in this. Um, we uh, do a lot of different work with insurance. We help people get coverage if you are currently uninsured or if you uh, are uh, soon to be uninsured. We help people understand and use their insurance. We help people know uh, how to advocate for themselves when insurance companies or providers or other people in the, uh, the system are not uh, responding the way they should. And we help deal with a lot of different uh, billing issues, including surprise bills when you uh, get a bill that you're not expecting uh, during a hospital stay. Uh, with coverage denials for important services uh, and with the appeals process when, uh, when uh, either an eligibility determination or a service coverage de uh, decision is negative. So before we get started and in going into some of the, uh, the specifics of what's changed uh, since the, uh, the coronavirus crisis began, uh, the first thing I want to do is talk a little bit about how the insurance market uh, is set up in Rhode Island and also nationally. Um, this can get a bit weedy. It's uh, very technical stuff. I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's, it's quite uh, uh, specific. But at the end of the day, it's really important because uh, the different ways that people get insurance in our very fractured insurance market uh, mean that different uh, plans and different forms of insurance have different rules that apply to them. 
Um, and that's not necessarily intuitive. So uh, in order for us to really understand the rules that have changed since the coronavirus crisis, um, we need to understand where those rules apply and where they don't. So as we all know, health insurance is a very fragmented industry. Uh, different plans are governed by different rules, but there are four main sets of rules that we want to think about. Um, and those, uh, those forms of insurance that are governed by their own individual kind of sets of rules are kind of can be subdivided into commercial insurance on one side. Uh, that's insurance that you either purchase directly from an insurance company or that uh, is provided to you through an employer. Uh, so coverage that you're offered at your job or coverage that you can, uh, can purchase uh, in Rhode Island, you can go directly to an insurance company and purchase a plan or uh, more frequently people will go through the Health Source Rhode Island Exchange, which allows you to qualify for some of the, uh, um, the tax credits and cost sharing reductions that make coverage a little bit more affordable. So that's on one side. And within the commercial world that breaks down into fully insured plans and self-insured plans. Fully insured plans are generally uh, small to medium sized employers, um, uh, frequently like mom and pop shops, not generally the bigger CVS corporation, Walmart corporation sort of insurance. Uh, fully insured plans also include the plans that people receive through HealthSource Rhode Island uh, or the ones that they purchase directly from an insurance company. Now on the other side, there are self-insured plans. Uh, those plans are generally with larger employers. There's some overlap. There's no uh, clear dividing line. There's not uh, a number of employees that you can say, oh, bigger than that self-insured, smaller is fully insured. If you're wondering about your own insurance or if you're uh, working with somebody uh, and you're trying to assist them and you need to figure out whether the insurance is fully or self-insured, it can frequently go either way. So frequently that's a question that has to go to the company's uh, human resources or benefits department. Now on the other side, uh, on the non-commercial side is uh, public coverage. Um, and public coverage covers a large number of people in Rhode Island as well. That's coverage that you get without paying for it or uh, paying for it through, um, through social security for, the, for Medicare. So uh, on the public side, uh, we'll look at this divided into Medicaid, which is an insurance program that is available to uh, low income uh, Rhode Islanders, including those who are disabled. Um, and then Medicare, uh, which covers those who are 65 and over, um, or those who have been on disability for two or more years. Um, it also covers a couple other uh, scenarios that don't come up that frequently, but it's the one that's governed by the, the federal government. And that's kind of how we've got this broken down. Um, in the commercial space, fully insured plans uh, and Medicaid plans are mostly governed by state law. It's sometimes different state law because some of them are commercial and Medicaid is public. Um, but those are mostly governed by state law. However, uh, self-insured plans and Medicare plans are not governed by state law. They are only governed by federal law with some very, very, very small exceptions. Um, but in the general scheme of things, if you have a self-insured plan because you work for a large employer or you have coverage through Medicare, um, the rules that govern that are uh, generally gonna come from the federal government. And that's important because in uh, the context of the coronavirus crisis, which we'll get to very shortly, uh, rules are coming down both from the state side and from the federal side. So it's really important to remember that when you look at a federal rule, it can apply to all markets. But when you look at a state rule, it's not going to apply to self-insured plans and it's not going to apply to people who have their coverage through Medicare. It will apply though to people who have fully insured coverage and people who have Medicaid coverage in Rhode Island. So before we jump too far into the insurance rules, Mark, have we had any, uh, any questions come in thus far? No questions yet, Seamus, but do you want to remind folks, if you do have a question at any point, feel free to hit the Q&A button and type it in and Seamus will do his best to answer it. All right, thanks, Mark. So we're gonna dive into the, uh, the new insurance rules. We'll start with a little bit of a primer on where those are coming from. Because uh, at this point, they're, they're, they're frequently coming out um, day after day. There's new clarifications that come out frequently. Um, a lot of the rules that really affect consumers uh, came out a little bit earlier. A lot of the ones that are coming out now are more provider focused, uh, which are important, but they're not really the focus of this presentation right now. Um, but, but I want to kind of point at a couple of places where those rules have come from. On the federal side, uh, the rules have frequently not been as robust or as uh, quick to be implemented as the state rules. And part of that is just because the federal bureaucracy moves more slowly than the state one does. Um, one of the biggest things that came out relatively early from the federal government is that almost all forms of insurance must make COVID-19 testing free. 
Uh, that's something that came out uh, originally with an agreement between uh, the administration and a lot of the larger insurance companies, and that was firmed up with uh, what was called the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. That was the first big coronavirus response bill that came from the federal government. Another big thing that's come out of federal uh, rulemaking and law so far is that telehealth is much more available. Um, so we as a society have been moving to telehealth, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, but we've been moving to telehealth for, for quite a while, and uh, this crisis kind of uh, was definitely a tipping point that allowed for it to be used in a lot more wide of circumstances and being promoted a lot more. Um, one really important thing to keep in mind, because this has come up a couple of times um, with uh, uh, perhaps questionable uh, phrasing uh, from the administration, um, is that coronavirus testing is free under almost all insurance types, but coronavirus treatment is not. Um, so there's been no agreement uh, by insurance companies and there's been no federal law saying that treatment for coronavirus will be free to consumers. Uh, you can absolutely still be charged for that under uh, just about all insurance forms. <clears throat> now on the state side, there's been many more state rules. Um, these cover a lot of different things. They go into a lot greater depth than the federal rules do. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we were talking about insurance markets. They only apply to fully insured plans and to Medicaid plans. Uh, so for individuals who are Rhode Islanders who have coverage through a self-insured plan frequently from working at a larger employer or who have Medicare coverage as their primary coverage, uh, the rules that we'll be talking about that are just state rules will not apply. As we go through the, uh, the following slides that talks about each of these new rules individually, I'll try to touch on whether the rule is coming from the federal or the state government. If it comes from the federal government, it probably touches all plans. And if it comes from the state government, we just have to keep in mind that it's only gonna touch those specific plans. So I wanna start with COVID-19 testing. Now we mentioned this on the, uh, the slide about federal uh, coverage. Um, but the big thing to take away here is that all COVID-19 tests are covered across all major insurance types. Um, and that is with no prior authorization requirement and that's with no copays. Now, no prior authorization means that the insurance company doesn't have to sign off on it before you can have the testing done for free. Uh, it doesn't mean that you don't need an appointment. And so any of the major testing sites in Rhode Island at this point, you can't just walk up without an appointment. You need to have an appointment. You need to have a uh, doctor's order or recommendation that you be going to get that testing. Um, but it means that it just has to come from a doctor. It does not have to go through your insurance company before you can get that test done free of charge. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind is that Medicaid already covers all screening and tests with no cost sharing to the consumer. Um, there are some questions around whether if you go to a doctor's appointment and are tested during a doctor's appointment or, or during an emergency room stay, whether you'll, have, you'll be charged for other aspects of the emergency room stay if it's uh, trying to test you out for other things. That's not 100% clear yet, depending on what form of insurance. But for Medicaid plans, you won't be paying for any of that. Um, and for the drive up testing site, uh, it looks like anyone with insurance in Rhode Island will not be paying for that either. Um, one thing really important to keep in mind though is that if you think that you or someone that you're caring for uh, may have COVID-19 and you need to get tested, uh, you need to contact your health provider, you need to get an order before you go to the uh, facility for testing, uh, just because uh, at this point, the, the Department of Health has made it very clear that they don't want people without uh, orders coming to the testing sites, both for their own safety and for the safety of the other people there. Um, Mark, any questions at this point or should we uh, jump on? No, uh, I think we can continue to move ahead. Thanks. All right, great. Uh, and one thing that I do want to want to say is for those of you who are at the uh, the last um, one of these webinars, some of this stuff is going to be kind of duplicative. We're going to be updating the slides as changes uh, take place. There are some things that we'll be talking about, including this, including uh, telemedicine that have had some changes, and there's some other things that have not had major changes just yet. Um, but just wanted to touch on that. Uh, so so some of this might might seem uh, familiar. Um, but it's good to keep in mind all of these, uh, these things are changing rapidly. And so we want to make sure that what we're saying today is accurate um, compared to what we said two weeks ago. So the next thing we want to jump into is Medicaid renewals. Um, that's something that came out very early from the state side and has kind of been confirmed by, by federal guidance as well, is that for the period during which the crisis is going on, um, all Medicaid renewals and reviews and most, if not all terminations um, are postponed until after the crisis. And what that means is if you have Medicaid now, and if you had Medicaid uh, about mid-March was the deadline uh, that they, or it's like the cutoff date, 
you had Medicaid as of that date, which I believe was March 17th, um, you cannot be terminated until the end of the crisis, uh, except for two reasons, or actually three reasons. The first reason being if, uh, um, if you pass away, they can terminate you from the Medicaid rolls. Second reason being uh, if you move out of the state, they can terminate you from the Medicaid rolls. And the third being if you voluntarily choose to have your Medicaid coverage terminated. Um, but otherwise, if you have Medicaid, um, you should be able to keep Medicaid for the remainder of the crisis. Uh, also, any new renewals that are going on, the, the annual process of that will get postponed until after the crisis. That being said, if you don't have Medicaid currently and you believe you're eligible, you can apply. Uh, those processes are still going normally. Um, DHS offices are closed, but you can submit the application online. You can submit the application through Health Source Rhode Island if you're eligible to do that, uh, or via a Dropbox at a DHS office where you go and you physically drop it off. Uh, you can't meet with somebody to discuss it or anything, but they will be able to take it and process it. And if you have questions, you can absolutely call the call center. Uh, our phone number there is 401-270-0101. It's on some of the earlier slides. It's on the slides at the end, and we'll make sure that's circulated to anybody who's looking for that assistance. Great, great. We, we do have one question that just came in about uh, testing. Uh, okay. how, how can an undocumented client of a nonprofit get tested? So nonprofit organizations working with undocumented uh, individuals, how can those people get tested? So I wanna come back to that in a little bit. Um, we actually have a slide specifically on some of the options for um, uninsured and un or undocumented immigrants. Um, so we, we're gonna address that in a little bit. Uh, so I'd, uh, if it's all right, I'd like to hold that question until that slide. And then if that individual still has that question, we can bring it back then, is that all right? Very good. So we're moving on quickly to Health Source Rhode Island. Um, the coverage that you can uh, receive there, that's the Affordable Care Act coverage, uh, Obamacare plans are frequently termed. Um, for individuals who are currently uninsured who may not qualify for Medicaid due to their income, there is a special enrollment period through Health Source Rhode Island that goes through, I believe, Wednesday of next week, uh, which is April 15th. Um, and that can be used by anyone uh, who is currently uninsured for any reason, uh, who wants to have coverage now during the coronavirus emergency. Um, that being said, that special enrollment period uh, is, is one thing and it helps anyone who is currently uninsured and has been uninsured, uh, but a lot more people are gonna qualify for special enrollment periods that already exist. Uh, when you lose coverage, you're eligible to purchase coverage through the exchange. Uh, and for anyone who is losing coverage through uh, through their work, they're able to then turn around and enroll in coverage through Health Source Rhode Island through a special enrollment period based on their loss of work coverage. Um, people can qualify for a special enrollment period due to a permanent move. So if someone was either living out of Rhode Island uh, or going to school outside of Rhode Island and had coverage through either their school or through the other state they were in, they've moved back to Rhode Island for the duration of the crisis, uh, that permanent move is uh, sufficient for a special enrollment period. Um, or a change in household. So if you had been living alone or um, perhaps with a, a spouse or partner um, and your children had been living outside of the state and they come back in or uh, the dependent structure changes. So you're going to be claiming someone as a dependent that you weren't previously uh, or vice versa. If someone leaves the state, uh, that change in household can frequently prompt a special enrollment period. So even after the, the 15th, when the coronavirus specific special enrollment period ends, a lot of people who are not going to have coverage will still have the ability um, to purchase a plan through Health Source Rhode Island. Uh, that coverage will frequently start the following month. Um, and for anyone who is looking for assistance in applying uh, or uh, qu has questions about whether they qualify to purchase coverage at this time, that's another thing that the Ripon Call Center can help with. I want to go briefly back to Medicaid for a half second. Um, for Health Source Rhode Island, if you're looking for coverage, you need to have a special enrollment period if you're not enrolling during that normal open enrollment period at the end of the year. For Medicaid, you can enroll at any time. So regardless of whether you're uninsured and you've been uninsured for a while or whether you just lost a job, if you're eligible for Medicaid, uh, you can apply for Medicaid at any time. Uh, coming back to that, uh, one thing that has kind of come up recently, especially on the federal side, is the additional funding for unemployment uh, and the stimulus checks, uh, as they've been termed, that are going out. The uh, economic uh, um, impact payments is the, uh, the technical term for them, uh, but they're the $1,200 checks that everyone has been talking about. Um, and one question that's come to us quite frequently is, will that count as income against me if I am trying to qualify for Medicaid 
or for a plan through HealthSource Rhode Island that I'm going to purchase. Um, and on the, the side of unemployment, one thing that we've noticed is that, uh, um, or one thing that's changed uh, substantively is that in addition to your normal unemployment uh, paycheck, you're getting an additional $600 from the federal government if you qualify for, for unemployment in a lot of circumstances. Um, this presentation isn't really about who qualifies for that and who doesn't. Um, that's something hopefully that we can have some, uh, some information linked on our COVID-19 resources page. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of people are getting that additional funds and they're worried that by getting that additional $600 a week, that might make them ineligible for Medicaid. One thing that the, the CARES Act, the uh, federal law that created that additional $600 payment did is it said that that $600 a week is not counted for the purposes of Medicaid eligibility. So if you were going to be Medicaid eligible, uh, not counting that additional $600 a week, um, the fact that you were getting con a considerably larger amount uh, of money per month works out to about $2,600 uh, over the course of a full month that $2,600 will not count for your Medicaid eligibility. So you may be able to continue your Medicaid eligibility despite that. However, it does count as income for the purposes of calculating tax credits or cost sharing reductions through HealthSource Rhode Island. So if you had purchased a plan and you were uh, benefiting from some of the affordability programs, they will take that income into account when determining the amount of tax credits you're eligible for. Um, now, the second big uh, source of income that has come out of uh, the CARES Act is the $1,200 stimulus checks or economic impact payments that are getting sent to everybody in, uh, in the country. Um, not to everyone in the country. Let me, let me rephrase that. To a lot of people in the country, uh, that's $1,200 per adult um, and $500 per child below the age of 17 who is claimed as a dependent on, a on an uh, adult's tax return. Again, there's a lot of questions about this. Um, we know that Social Security disability recipients and retirement uh, recipients um, will be able to receive their $1,200. Uh, there's some more questions about whether SSI recipients will be able to, and we do know that dependents over the age of 16, so from 17 and up, um, anyone who is claimed as a tax dependent will not be eligible for a stimulus payment. Um, those payments are starting to come out in mid-April and they are classified as a tax credit. So they are not classified as income. So when you get that income, it's not going to impact your Medicaid eligibility. It won't impact your uh, uh, eligibility for long-term services. And it won't impact your eligibility for health source plans at all. It's not gonna be looked at as income. Uh, Mark, we got any questions? We do have a question that came in about the SEP. Is the SEP, the special enrollment period, ending April 15th for both COVID and tax filers? So I, I believe that, and that's, that's a good question. There was, there was a, um, a special enrollment period for tax filers that went through April 15th, uh, and the tax filing deadline was postponed. I do not know if that uh, special enrollment period, which is very specific to, to individuals who are claiming that they did not know about the individual mandate and are enrolling because of that. If that special enrollment period is being postponed, I haven't heard anything about that. We can look into that. Um, I think that that, uh, that specific special enrollment period was relatively underutilized. Um, and uh, I think that there's a lot of other special enrollment periods that are more frequently going to apply in those circumstances. Um, but we can, if, if that comes up, that's something absolutely the Ripen Call Center can look more into and determine whether it's, uh, it's gonna be usable for somebody who is calling and uh, is looking for coverage based on that. Great, um, that's all we have for questions at the moment. All right. So uh, I wanted to come back to this because this, uh, this kind of touches on the question that we had about um, uh, individuals who do not have necessarily a, 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 full, a documented legal immigration status. Uh, so for undocumented immigrants uh, or for uninsured people, regardless of their immigration status, um, there are uh, a number of options for uninsured individuals to still get COVID-19 testing. Um, and then additionally for treatment for, for COVID-19 and for a lot of other conditions in Rhode Island. Um, this is something that the Ripen Call Center works with frequently. So if your, answer, if your question is not answered by what we're gonna talk about on this slide, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. This is something we work with quite frequently. Um, but Rhode Island has indicated that uninsured residents can obtain free COVID-19 testing at the drive-up sites with an appointment. 
so that you can use those drive up sites. Those are the three National Guard operated sites uh, throughout Rhode Island uh, or the CVS uh, operated site in Lincoln. Um, any of those uh, locations can provide COVID-19 testing to uninsured Rhode Islanders um, so long as they are a Rhode Island resident. Um, we had some questions about how that would work with regard to individuals without uh, a documented immigration status. Um, and that has not been 100% resolved yet, but we do know that the, uh, the recent changes that went through to Rhode Island Medicaid regulations included something called emergency Medicaid. It doesn't come up that frequently, but it provides for coverage uh, for people regardless of their documentation status um, or their immigration status uh, in cases of emergencies. And what this change did was it said that during the COVID, uh, the coronavirus, the COVID-19 emergency, treatment for and testing for uh, coronavirus or for COVID-19 counts as an emergency condition that can be covered by emergency Medicaid. Now, this is an income limited uh, program. So for uh, undocumented immigrants above the income limit for Medicaid for their status or for their, 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 um, their classification, whether they're an adult or a parent or a child, um, for individuals who are over that, uh, that income status, this will not apply. But for anyone who falls under the Medicaid income limit, they can have emergency Medicaid coverage for their testing for their COVID-19 treatment, which means they shouldn't have to pay out of pocket for it. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, low income residents uh, who are eligible based on their immigration status can apply for Medicaid at any time and the Ripon Call Center can assist with that. Mark, we have another question? Famous, yeah. So on this, on this slide, Rhode Island has indicated, uh, and somebody wants to know what, what exactly does that mean? It sounds a little uh, sure. wobbly. Yep, and, and it's kind of meant to sound a little wobbly in our, in our way of putting it there because we can't commit Rhode Island to anything that they haven't committed to. This is coming from the Rhode Island Department of Health's website. On their website, they have a, a list of resources for uh, uninsured Rhode Islanders. And that, in, uh, that specifically states that if you are an insured Rhode Islander, you can obtain testing at a, a healthcare facility at a hospital, at a doctor's appointment, or at one of the drive-up sites, so long as you have an appointment for whichever one you choose. It does say that uninsured Rhode Islanders can only uh, guarantee that they're going to get um, covered or free testing for COVID-19 through one of the drive-up sites. They can't just walk up to a healthcare facility. Um, but that's coming from what the Rhode Island Department of Health is saying. We do have those questions about how that's going to work with regard to uh, immigrants who do not have legal status um, or do not have qualifying status for Medicaid or for other insurance programs, um, specifically those who are over income for Medicaid but are not eligible for other coverage. Um, so we've got some questions about that. We're still working to figure that out. Um, a lot of this is happening very quickly. A lot of these rules have not been implemented as clearly as we'd like. And so we wanna make sure that when we don't know the answer to a question, we're communicating that these things are still open questions. Um, but we're absolutely happy to, if we have, uh, if we're working with an individual client who has that question and wants to, is worried about getting charged, that's absolutely something that they're welcome to reach out to us and that we can try to assist with. Interesting. Yeah. And, and I think it is worth pointing out that um, because we were talking about undocumented immigrants, that the, the governor has made it very clear that there's no kind of immigration reporting or enforcement of any kind at any of these testing sites. So that's important to, I think, reiterate that folks know that it is safe to go to these sites, no matter their immigration status, their documentation status. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that, Mark. Uh, we have another question going back to the, the tax stuff and the credits, the stimulus mm -hmm. payments. And this individual asks if the stimulus checks need to be reported when they do their 2020 taxes. So a little bit outside of the realm of health insurance, but do you know, sure. how do you know if they need to report that as income when they file their taxes for 2020? So that's, uh, that, um, it's definitely outside of the realm of health insurance, but uh, it, it's actually a pretty easy answer in that this, the $1,200 payment or whatever you're going to receive, sometimes it's less if your income is over a certain amount. Um, sometimes it's more if you're claiming kids as well. That's framed as a tax credit. So there will probably be um, a process when you file your taxes of reporting what you received, or it might already like be, be available there on the, uh, the tax form. Um, 
but it is, uh, it is framed as a tax credit. So if you receive more than you end up being eligible for, it's possible you uh, may end up paying some of that back. We're not entirely sure all of that, the tax side of that um, is outside of some of what we can really assist with. Uh, it's also something that to my understanding has not been necessarily fully baked by the treasury yet. Uh, so we don't know what that process is exactly going to look like once it comes around. Um, but it looks like it's going to be a tax credit. So it won't really be claimed as income, uh, which is what we were saying in the previous slide that uh, when we look at uh, eligibility for other programs, including Medicaid or Health Social for Rhode Island, this is a tax credit, it's not income. Um, so it's, it's kind of a weird ephemeral, sort of weird wibbly wobbly uh, like definition there. Um, but it does not count as income for the purposes of any of the programs that we're, uh, we're working with here in, in health insurance. Great, that's all the questions we have right now. All right, we'll move on. Um, this is another one that came back to some of the earlier state rules uh, that uh, anyone who's watched the, the earlier version of this presentation should be familiar with, uh, which is that in, for state uh, law governed plans, and that's the fully insured plans and the Medicaid plans, uh, those plans must allow early refills of prescriptions. Um, there's some caveats on that. Uh, it basically means that if you today want to go in and get a refill of a prescription that hasn't run out yet, that maybe you still have 14 days worth of, but you want to pick up another refill of it to keep yourself from having to go back to the pharmacy for the next 30 days, um, that's something that you can do. But the prescription has to be something that uh, goes through the end of that new refill. So if you're going to get a new 30 day supply now, then they're gonna look at 30 days from now. If the prescription is going to expire uh, between now and when your, your um, prescription runs out, then they're not gonna be able to refill it for you. There's also some restrictions when it comes to, uh, to specific uh, sch like scheduled uh, controlled substances. Um, but for the most part, individuals who wanna receive an early prescription refill can do that. Now that's only, like I said, for fully insured plans and for Medicaid plans. To my understanding, there haven't really been any of that motion when it comes to self-insured plans uh, or to Medicare Part D plans or to some other forms of coverage. And then to talk a little bit about telemedicine. Now this is something that uh, is very different across a, a wide variety of insurance types. Um, Frequently and uh, before the crisis, when you were having a telemedicine visit, you needed to do it through a means that allowed you to both see and hear your doctor. Um, and there's a wide variety of reasons for that. It frequently goes back to HIPAA. Um, but at least during the crisis, the state has relaxed those rules, allowing you, if you have a fully insured plan or a Medicaid plan, to engage in an audio only or a telephone uh, telemedicine visit. So essentially a phone call with your doctor that counts as a visit during which they can write a prescription, they can give you treatment guidance, any of that. Uh, Self-insured plans are allowed uh, to, to cover telemedicine more broadly. There's been some relaxation of what uh, is required for telemedicine at the federal level, um, but that's something that needs to take place on a plan-by-plan -plan basis. There's n there has not yet been any federal guidance requiring any changes to that. Um, and Medicare allows some telephone only evaluations, but evaluations is the specific word there. Uh, it's not a full visit. Um, there's a number of different things that can be done during an evaluation, but it generally has to be done with um, an already existing patient uh, doctor relationship. Um, and there's still a lot of other services under Medicare that require both audio and visual, which for a lot of people who don't have smartphones, uh, that's not something they're able to do. Um, and it doesn't allow telemedicine for all visits. There's still some visits under Medicare that you can't even do over audiovisual telemedicine you actually have to do with an in-person visit. That's also evolving. There's been a lot of guidance that's come out of CMS recently about that. Uh, that's the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the federal agency that oversees Medicare. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the gist of that is that if you have Medicare, there are still gonna be a lot of circumstances where telemedicine may not be an option for you. And another really important thing to keep in mind is that with all of these changes, these are changes that affect the insurance company. These are not regulatory changes that force any doctor to do anything that either they're not comfortable with or they don't have the technology for, or they don't have the time for. Uh, if your doctor does not want to do telemedicine, there's nothing that, that's forcing your doctor to do that. Um, you can request it uh, and you can look for doctors that are offering that, but it's not something that every provider is going to be able to provide. Mark, we have some questions? 
Great. Yeah. Uh, one question on the telemedicine. Is it only for COVID-19 related concerns or can other matters qualify for it? It sounds like you're saying, saying yes, it's not just for COVID-19, but depending on the insurance type and your provider, you may or may not be able to get it for other services. That's, that's absolutely right. So it's not just for COVID-19. It's actually specifically to take some pressure off of the system to allow people who have just routine medical checkups to get that done. Um, and so depending on what your condition is and what your type of insurance is, uh, you may be able to get telemedicine for a very wide variety of services within um, fully insured plans and Medicaid. If your provider's willing to offer it, uh, you can get it for just about any sort of service. Uh, within Medicare, it's a little bit more restrictive. Self-insured is kind of somewhere in the middle, um, but it, it's certainly much wider than just COVID-19 related questions. Great. You mentioned emergency Medicaid. The language, the questioner says, the language says it covers treatment as well as testing. Yep. What qualifies for emergency? So to go back to that, let me actually just go back to that slide real quick. Um, emergency Medicaid covers individuals uh, regardless of their immigration status, so long as they are income eligible. Um, it, it essentially pays the provider for the coverage that that individual received um, so that that individual uh, will not be billed for it. Um, or so the provider is, is made whole for the services they've rendered and they're not necessarily going to pursue it further. Um, emergency has a specific definition in, this, in the, uh, the regulations governing this. Um, what this change did was it included COVID-19 testing and COVID-19 treatment as an emergency that allows someone to receive emergency Medicaid regardless of their immigration status. Now we're still seeing how that's going to get implemented. Um, it does say, it does include treatment in addition to testing. Um, so it's, uh, it's not quite clear what might necessarily fall under treatment, but our understanding is that the variety of services that an individual would expect to receive across the, uh, the, the spectrum of, of services um, including hospitalization, including overnight stays, including any of that um, for COVID-19 treatment would be included under that. It's not 100% clear yet. We're still working on, on breaking that down, um, but it, it is important to note that this does cover both treatment, uh, both testing and treatment under this, uh, this emergency Medicaid rule. So Seamus, how, how is the income eligibility determined for someone who's undocumented when they, when they may not be reporting, when that undocumented individual may not be reporting their income? Sure. Um, so and that, that can get into a deeper dive than I, than I know that I think I'd be ready to, to kind of dive into during this presentation. Uh, I could certainly take quite a bit longer than I think we have time for, um, but it's frequently determined the same way that it's determined for anyone else. Um, there's a large, large number of people who have income that does not get reported regardless of their immigration status. There's uh, plenty of people who work under the table. Uh, there's plenty of people who have uh, self-employment income that might not be, be adequately reported. Um, and so the state tracks that the same way they track anyone else. Uh, frequently, individuals uh, who might not have legal immigration status will still have an I-10 uh, and still will still be reporting some of that, uh, or at least the, uh, the, their employer may be reporting some of that. Um, and frequently, a lot of it is done similarly to, to other Medicaid uh, eligibility determinations by having an individual just attest what their income is. Great. So back to the telemedicine again. Uh, mm -hmm. I, this question is, I hear a lot of telemedicine as far as Medicaid and other plans, but do Medicare Advantage plans qualify for that, for telemedicine? So Medicare Advantage plans are governed by largely the same rules as Medicare. Uh, so they generally cannot cover telemedicine services going beyond what Medicare allows. Uh, they're governed by the same some rules under HIPAA, the same rules under Medicare um, kind of guidance. And so an individual with a Medicare Advantage plan or original Medicare or Medicare with a Medicare supplement plan uh, would be restricted in the same way as, uh, as is kind of listed here on the slide where you're able to get an evaluation, you're able to get some other services, uh, but frequently both audio and visual will be required for other services uh, and not all services will be allowed. And finally, for the moment anyway, uh, and this is going back a little ways, this is another question that's more geared toward the taxes and, and someone asking if 
people do people need to pay back the stimulus check in next year's tax return? That's getting farther than I think that we're really going to be able to address. I don't think that yeah. this has come out yet. Uh, and that's all going to come from the IRS. That's going to be a little bit outside of our, uh, our health insurance focus to be able to interpret too well. Um, so I would advise individuals who are worried about that uh, to once it comes time to file next year's taxes to consult with a tax professional. Um, and I'm sure between now and then much clearer guidance will come out. Right now, the, the federal government has been worried about getting this money out to people is my understanding. They've been less worried about how it's gonna look on the back end when everyone has to file their taxes next year. Great, all right, thank you, Seamus. Absolutely. All right, um, so to talk a little bit again on largely the state side here, um, Within the, the Medicaid realm, there's, there's hearings and appeals for a lot of different things. You can have a hearing based on a determination that you are either over income or otherwise ineligible for Medicaid. Um, you can also have hearings about coverage determinations. Um, and those hearings uh, largely before the crisis would take place in person in front of a hearing officer. Now, needless to say, the state has been trying to limit any sort of circumstances where anyone is face to face with anyone. Um, and so for that reason, uh, all face-to-face -face, um, hearings have, to my understanding, been postponed until after the crisis. Um, individuals who have uh, a need for an expedited hearing can do so uh, during the crisis, um, and that will be done uh, either via telephone or by video conference, whichever one is easier to use for the, uh, the individual who is requesting the appeal. Um, but those other non-expedited, non-urgent hearings, uh, which frequently regard uh, coverage decisions for things that have taken place in the past, um, those hearings will be postponed until after the crisis, uh, at which point they can take place in person again. Um, now that is kind of just very specific to the Medicaid world um, and to the Medicaid world as far as it relates to state decision-making. Um, where those are the fair hearings that take place in front of a, a state administrative officer. For Medicaid managed care plan hearings, those are if you have Medicaid frequently, you have Neighborhood or United or Tufts as your uh, insurance plan. Those appeals are still going on, as far as I understand currently, as normal. Um, there's uh, a lot of hearings that take place for our insurance through any other form, uh, whether you get it through an employer or you buy it through health source, those are all taking place as normal. Um, and Medicare also has an appeals process that involve, that's a little bit different from that, but it's largely done telephonically. And so those things are not a, a, impacted the same way as an in-person hearing is. So our understanding is pretty much anything else is going as normal, but if you have a state hearing, it's gonna be a little bit different. Um, then, uh, sorry. Sorry, uh, sorry, we do have some questions if, if, if okay. you wanna take some questions yeah. real quick. Um, this person asks, is there any kind of sort of a, they, they phrase it in terms of a better business bureau, but for healthcare providers, right? Is there any sort of way to report on those providers, whether it's health, whether it's telemedicine issues or other issues where the provider is just not responsive um, and saying that they know of clients who have been in a situation where they've been waiting for over a week or, or even longer to get any type of response from their doctors when they submit a question through the patient portals, um, sure. medication has been delayed as a result of not being able to get this response. So, mm -hmm. you know, more and more of these provider offices are directing their patients to the patient portal saying this is the primary way to communicate with them. But is yep. there any recourse that the patient has when they use that patient portal um, and they get no response? Sure. Um, so, I guess the, uh, the, the lead here is that there's no one necessarily way that all providers are going to have some overarching thing regulating every aspect of that. Um, some of these questions might go to, to one state agency, some might go to another. It's gonna obviously depend on whether they're a Rhode Island provider or a Massachusetts provider that someone's seeing. Um, and it's also going uh, to be something that is gonna be probably evaluated differently during the crisis than it might be at other times. Um, there's also frequently uh, differences based on the insurance product that the individual uses. But the recommendation here is call Ripen, call us. That's absolutely something that we work with quite frequently. Um, if you are a consumer and you feel like your provider is not responding to you at an, in a, an adequate amount of time, 
or the answer is inadequate, um, we can absolutely work to see where that complaint should go, whether it's a complaint that should be addressed to the Department of Health or to some other organization. Um, and we can we, we do that quite frequently, even outside of these, this crisis, but please call us. That's something that we can absolutely take a look at. Great, thank you, Seamus. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Mark? Uh, no, we had we have one individual who asked about the availability of these slides. And okay. yeah, I can, that's one that I can answer. We will send a link to a PDF of the slides. You can also view a recording of this webinar and all of our webinars on our YouTube channel. And we'll send out a link to that as well. Great. Um, now to move on a little bit, this is now uh, also in the, the world of Medicaid specifically um, and for individuals who are receiving long-term care, either as home and community-based services in the community or in a long-term care institution. Um, as we talked about earlier, Medicaid renewals and recertifications, uh, largely any of the, um, the determinations that take place on an annual or a routine basis, those are generally going to be postponed until after the crisis. The same is true for long-term supports and services. If someone has been determined eligible uh, based on their level of care need for either a high level of care or the highest level of care, um, and those kind of correspond to the amount of, of services you can receive through home and community-based services, uh, or um, whether you're eligible for coverage to, to be in a long-term care institution, either an assisted living or a nursing home. If those determinations have been made, um, they're generally updated on an annual basis to confirm that they're still active. Um, any of those renewals will, similar to any other Medicaid review decision, be postponed until after the crisis. So anything that has been determined now will stay in place for the rest of the crisis. Um, that being said, as we said about Medicaid, if you don't currently have that authorization and you need it, those processes are still working. You can still request that. You can still be determined uh, eligible for that level of care. Um, but ordinarily those determinations are done with an in-person sort of determination. If you're looking for services in your home, that frequently involves a, uh, an evaluation of your home to see, to see what sort of um, services might be needed and, and kind of do that evaluation in person. Uh, or frequently that can be done for, for a long-term care placement as well. Um, any of those things will be postponed as well and those determinations will be made entirely remotely. And then also on the Medicaid front, um, prior authorizations, these are the things that doctors have to put in in order for a service to be covered. Uh, the doctor writes to the insurance company, says, this is what I'm requesting. The insurance company comes back and says, all right, go ahead with the procedure. Um, Medicaid uh, is intending to suspend the need for most of those, but not all prior authorizations for the length of the crisis. Uh, and this is something that we don't have a lot of clarity on. You'll see the word most. This is kind of a weasel word. We're not, we're not saying all. Um, and that's, that's what the regulation says. We don't know exactly what prior authorizations may still be required. Uh, we do know that we have seen a number of individuals that we've supported uh, who normally receive routine prior authorizations, either for a prescription or for some sort of service that's ongoing, um, where those requirements have been relaxed. So we know there has been movement made, but we don't necessarily know where that might still be needed. Um, and for anyone who has a currently active prior authorization, that will be extended through the length of the crisis. Um, now, this is just for Medicaid. Now, other plans, including fully insured plans, including self-insured plans, um, can choose to suspend the need for prior authorizations, uh, but there's been no requirement. This, uh, this requirement was a state requirement and it only applied to Medicaid. For any other plan out there, they can uh, kind of operate as they choose to, and we haven't seen a lot of motion to suggest that other plans are relaxing the need for prior authorizations at this time. Questions, Mark? Questions, none at the moment. Great. Um, one thing that we work with pretty frequently at Ripen, um, outside of the crisis, but certainly during the crisis, is the, the concept of network adequacy. And that what that means is that when you have insurance, uh, you should be able to see a provider of any specialty that you should not be restricted from being able to see um, a provider that, that does what you need them to do, uh, just based on the way that, that the insurance network is constructed. Now, you don't need to be able to see every provider that does the specific thing that you want, um, but they must have an adequate enough network that if you need um, a nephrologist for a kidney condition or you need a pulmonologist for a lung condition, 
um, that there are enough in the network that have available appointments that you can see. Um, and this is a rule, this is not a special rule uh, necessarily during this crisis, um, but it's one that has a special application now because as the healthcare system gets more and more uh, potentially overwhelmed with cases um, and as providers are kind of called into doing other duty, um, it's possible that a provider that you would normally want to see will not have any open appointments. Um, and so during this crisis and at any other time, the insurance company you work with needs to have enough other doctors that have that specialty that allows you to see somebody. And if they don't, and if there's only a few doctors in Rhode Island and they only have two in the network and they don't have any appointments, then you have to be able to see an out of network doctor and only pay as much as you would be paying if you were to see an in network doctor. They can't hold the fact that there's no one available against you and, chart and essentially make you pay more. Um, now, in order to benefit this or to make this a little bit easier, uh, Medicaid is making it much easier for providers to enroll, including out-of-state providers who wanna offer telemedicine services. They're also postponing provider reaccreditations. Um, a lot of other plans can relax their rules for enrolling new providers and maybe doing so. Uh, we're not kind of as proxy to that as we are to Medicaid, but we know that uh, if an individual needs to see a doctor of a certain specialty and is not able to, that's something that Ripen can absolutely assist with and they should be able to see the, uh, a doctor outside of their network um, and still pay the in-network rate if that happens. So great question came in about the, the network adequacy. Sure. Does that out of network provider option still apply when the network has an appointment, but it's months away? So is there any kind of timeliness factor if I need to see a specialist, there is one in network, but he's not available for months. Sure. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, and yes, there is a timeliness factor. If you need to see a doctor on an emergency basis about something um, or on a more urgent basis than, than a month away appointment will satisfy, uh, you can absolutely work to file um, what they call a network exception, which allows you to see an out of network provider. Um, that's again, as I mentioned earlier, something that Ripen does frequently, even when the coronavirus crisis is not uh, in full swing. Um, so please, if you've got questions about that, if you need to see a provider, um, but the only in-network providers have appointments months away and that's not gonna work for you, call us and we can see if there's something we can do to assist. Great. All right. So we got a couple more slides and then we wanna make sure we've got a little bit more time for questions. Um, one big thing that's come out recently from some of the, uh, the federal guidance um, is some extensions of what can be covered. Um, so we don't want to dive too far into what a high deductible health plan is because it's kind of a, a very specific technical thing, but frequently uh, it's coverage that you'll get through work uh, that has a higher deductible than a lot of other coverage you would potentially get through work. I mean, there's a lot of plans out there that have high deductibles that don't count as high deductible health plans. It's a very specific term, um, but frequently it's a, a plan with a high deductible that you get from work that's paired with uh, a health reimbursement account, an HRA, um, that gives you funds to help meet that deductible. Now, it's not always paired with an HRA that's fully funded, and so for that reason, people still frequently end up paying a lot out of pocket before they can use that sort of coverage. Um, and in order for pretty much anything to be covered with one of those plans, you have to pay the whole deductible out of pocket. Uh, and that can be thousands of dollars that you might not have available. Um, the federal government has made it clear that telemedicine services and COVID-19 testing services uh, can be covered pre-deductible and high deductible health plans. Now with telemedicine services, you may still have a copay um, but you'll be able to just have the copay rather than be paying the full cost of the telemedicine services before meeting the deductible. For COVID-19 testing, you shouldn't be paying anything, uh, and that's available pre-deductible that you don't have to pay for. Um, another big change has been that menstrual health products, which are generally not something that's reimbursable uh, under uh, an HRA, an HSA, an FSA, any of those acronyms that gives you tax-preferred kind of funds that you can use to spend on health products. Menstrual health products were generally excluded from that for at least the duration of the crisis, they are included so you can use those funds to purchase menstrual health products. Um, and if a vaccine is developed and released, obviously this hasn't happened yet, um, but if a vaccine does come around, uh, it will be covered without cost sharing under all major insurance types. There's uh, rules under the Affordable Care Act that require that preventive services uh, be covered uh, without cost share to the consumer and uh, any sort of COVID-19 vaccine that would be developed would count as that. 
Um, and one final thing that we want to touch on now, a lot of the things we've talked about thus far are extensions of coverage, are things that have uh, gotten more broad since the, the crisis. This is something that kind of goes both ways. There has been a bit of a retraction here, um, is with non-emergency medical transportation. Um, and what's happened here is that because uh, there's an anticipated larger strain on the system in that there's going to be more people needing to go to appointments due to the COVID-19 emergency, but also potentially less drivers available either due to the emergency and them not being able to, to work because they're supporting a family member or because they're not working or just due to a, an unwillingness to, to transport patients during this sort of circumstance. Um, Medicaid has uh, proposed limiting non-emergency medical transportation to essential appointments. What that means is normally when you have Medicaid, you are eligible uh, if you don't have other forms of transportation uh, for some uh, for an individual through the uh, through MTM is the state's firm uh, through a non-emergency medical transportation provider to pick you up, drive you to the appointment, and then drive you home after. Um, now that's generally available to all appointments. That will just be available to essential appointments for the duration of the crisis. We don't have a clear definition of what essential means. Um, but it's more than just testing for COVID-19. It includes things like you have a dialysis appointment or any other sort of emergency or uh, urgent uh, necessary appointment, you'll still be able to get transportation for that. Um, but for routine checkups, which they're frequently suggesting that you postpone until after the crisis anyway, you might not be able to get transportation. Um, that being said, one big uh, thing that's come out recently is that if you are somebody who is on Medicaid, who relies on non-emergency medical transportation to appointments, you don't have other forms of transportation, uh, MTM will dr uh, drive you to one of the drive-through testing sites if you have an order to be tested for COVID-19. Um, now that's something that obviously they've got a, a smaller capacity for. Um, and so they're really asking anybody who has other forms of transportation to rely on that first. Um, but if you don't and you need to get tested for COVID-19, don't use the fact that you don't have transportation um, as, as a reason not to get tested. MTM will drive you to that appointment. All right. Do we have any questions before we jump into the little review? Yeah. One question. Is there any way to get your own transportation, so take an Uber or whatever, and then be reimbursed for that after the fact? Sure. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, that specific example, I don't believe uh, exists yet. So you can't just call yourself an Uber and expect to get reimbursed. Um, there's been talk about expanding to something like that, but that hasn't happened. Uh, what, ha what does exist is if you can rely on somebody else, whether that's a family member or a trusted friend uh, or another relative or something, um, who drives you to uh, an appointment that would qualify for non-emergency medical transportation, that person can get reimbursed. So you can't necessarily go to a ride sharing company, but you can use a family member or a friend to provide transportation. Then that individual can go onto MTM's website. There's a, a form that my understanding is, is relatively straightforward that you kind of fill out where you drove somebody, what it was for, you send that in, and then you can get a reimbursement check for uh, um, the, the mileage to, to drive to that appointment. And does, does the non-emergency medical transportation still apply to the elderly transportation program, or is it just for Medicaid recipients at this time? I'm not totally sure I understand the question. Um, so that I, I will say that they, they, they write elderly transportation program, capital E, capital T, capital P. So it sounds mm -hmm. like this is some kind of, I've never heard of it myself, but there's some kind sure. of program that's in place. Yeah. Um, I'm vaguely familiar with the program. I'm not 100% sure with the rules on it because it is, it's not specifically a, um, a health insurance related one is my understanding. Um, I, these rules on when it comes to limiting essential or limiting a transportation to essential appointments are specific to Medicaid. They're in the Medicaid regulations. Um, and that's what that was, that was proposed to, to change. Um, I'm not sure if there has been a similar restriction to the elderly transportation program. I would not be surprised if there was, um, but that's something that, that I don't have a direct answer to. Um, but if, if, you're, if you're looking for kind of specific guidance on that, feel free to give us a call after this and we can take a look. Uh, is there a minimum number of in-network doctors one must go through before an out-of-network doctor may be eligible. So I guess before seeking that um, 
I forget what you called it. But the we'll network on. adequacy, the network exception. Network exception. There you go. Yeah. It, you have to go through a certain number of, of like in network, you know, tries and fails before you can sure. do that. And that, that's a good question. The, the, there's no uh, golden rule there. Um, there's no specific number and it's going to be different depending on different specialties. Um, the, the way that that works too is the determination is made by the insurance company. Um, and if the determination that's made by the insurance company is not satisfactory, then it can be appealed upwards. And there's also regulatory bodies that oversee that. So if the insurance company is saying, no, we've got a perfectly adequate network, but no one's able to get any appointments, then there's ways that can, that, that can get addressed outside of the internal process. Um, but no, there's no, it's not that you just have to call a number of in-network providers and find three or five or seven that don't, that don't have appointments. Um, frequently, though, that's not going to be the best way to, to find a doctor in that circumstance. Um, that's something that we can help with, but frequently the, uh, the insurance company might have a more up-to-date list of their providers that have open appointments, um, that sometimes that is a, a beneficial way of going about it. Um, sometimes there's other agencies, maybe uh, colleges of a specific uh, um, specialty that have better knowledge about that, about which doctors have availability. Um, and really, I mean, you can have a, a small uh, class of providers, for example, pediatric nephrologists, of which there's only a very small handful in Rhode Island. And if there's only two in your network and you call both of them, then that's going to be sufficient. But then if you're talking about primary care providers that has a, a much wider number, um, then it's going to take a lot more than that to allow you to see an out-of-network doctor. Um, you might have to, to put some boots on the ground. You might also uh, be able to coordinate with um, either the insurance company or another agency to try to find a doctor. So no hard and fast rules, case by case yep. basis. Great. Um, and then kind of one big overarching question, the extensions of coverage, basically everything we're talking about today is only because of the crisis. Mm -hmm. After that, will it all go back to the old way? So it's going to be kind of uh, piece by piece. Um, Yes, largely a lot of these rules are framed in a way that sunsets once the crisis ends that says, so long as the emergency declaration is active, you can do this, this, and this. Um, again, these rules have frequently been uh, written in a way that allows them to gear up quickly, and the sunset of them has not been as well uh, thought out. Um, it's not totally clear what that process is going to look like, what the, uh, the, the end of the declaration will look like. Um, there will probably be a lot of changes between now and then. Um, but yes, at the end of the day, a lot of these things will go away once the crisis ends, um, whether they go away to the status quo as it was before, or whether they go away to some new sort of way that we, we set things up uh, will depend on how much work gets done and how the regulatory atmosphere changes between now and whenever the crisis ends. Okay, very good. All right. Well, we want to do a really quick review of the, the key takeaways from here, because I know that was a ton of information. Um, it continues to be a ton of information. Uh, I feel like I'm drinking out of the, uh, the fire faucet, fire faucet, the fire hydrant. <laughs> um, but like it, it, it's a lot to distill. So we want to kind of point at some of the, the most important things, um, which are that COVID-19 testing should be free. Uh, kind of across the board, regardless of your immigration status, regardless of your uh, um, uh, form of insurance, regardless of uh, your income level. Um, uh, and that's kind of, that's something that we're still trying to figure out exactly how it's working for every individual. But for um, the purpose of this presentation, COVID-19 testing should be free. Um, Medicaid renewals are on hold. Uh, if you've got Medicaid now, you should have it through the end of the crisis. Uh, any of the documentation that you would normally have to recertify, that should not be taking place right now. Uh, you can get early refills for prescriptions if you have either a fully insured plan or a, a Medicaid plan. Um, and the special enrollment periods are available. And that's a really important one because as things go on, people are continuing to lose their jobs. People are continuing to lose their coverage through, uh, through work. Uh, or through a lot of other forms. People are coming back from school and not going back. People are losing their, their coverage from school. Um, and there's ways to get coverage. And if you've got questions about that, please call us. That's something that we work in day in and day out. Uh, we try to stay up to date on all of this. We're gonna keep updating this presentation. I'm sure this isn't the last time I'll be giving this. Um, 
but between now and then, if anything changes, we're going to hopefully have the most up-to-date information available. So please call us 401-270-0101. Uh, write us at callcenter at ripen.org. Um, you can see down at the bottom here, there's our website, our Facebook, and our Twitter and Instagram handles. Um, you can keep up with a lot of the developments there. Um, and uh, especially want to point out one thing that exists on our website. If you go to that www.ripen.org website, scroll down just a little bit, um, there's the COVID-19 resources page. Um, that includes a lot of the resources that we've talked about today, a lot of the uh, sources of those resources, including a lot of what the, the state government has said um, and where these rules are coming from. It also has a lot of other great resources kind of across the, uh, the, the course of what Ripen does. We're an organization that does health insurance work, but we also do education work uh, and work in a lot of other areas. Um, you can find resources about schools, about special education, um, a lot of other great stuff there, including, and then also links to a lot of what other state agencies are doing. So I can't recommend that page enough. Great. Well, thank you, Seamus. We are over time. I want to thank Seamus for his presentation. I want to thank everybody who joined us today for submitting all your great questions. There's a recording of this webinar available as soon as it's over right on our YouTube channel. Uh, and as, ripen, as uh, Seamus said, rather, you can find more information on our website. And feel free to give us a call if you have any further questions or concerns regarding your health insurance. Uh, other than that, please stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, everybody.